Evening, everybody. Turn your hymnals to 235. Once like a bird in prison I dwell, no freedom from my sorrow I fell. But Jesus came and listened to me, and glory to God, he set me free. He set me free, yes, he set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see for glory to God. He set me free. Now I am climbing higher each day. Darkness of night has drifted away. My feet are planted on higher ground, and glory to God, I'm homeward bound. He set me free, yes, He set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see for glory to God. He set me free. Goodbye to sin and Things that confound, not of the world shall turn me around. Daily I'm working, I'm praying to, and glory to God I'm going through. He set me free, yes, He set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound by Jesus to see for glory to God. He set me free. He set me free. Yes, He set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound by Jesus to see for glory to God. He set me free. Great singing, kids. I think we're going to start things off with Everett tonight. Let's get behind him as he sings for us. I'm going to try a couple hymns on you tonight. Uh, I don't know. Hymns are kind of, man, that thing's hot. Hymns are kind of, uh, what are they to me, backbone of gospel music for me. You know, I think 
A lot of people like him, so I'll try a couple tonight. My heart was distressed neath Jehovah's red frown And low in the pit where my sins dragged me down I cried to the Lord from the deep miry clay Who tenderly brought me out to golden day soul today a song of praise hallelujah he placed me upon the strong rock by his side my steps were established and here i'll abide no danger of falling while here i remain but stand by his grace until the crown i gain song in my soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. He gave me a song, t'was a new song of praise, by day and by night its sweet notes I will raise. My heart's overflowing, I'm happy and free. I praise my Redeemer who has rescued me. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. And He puts a song in my soul today. A song of praise. Hallelujah. I'll sing of His wonderful mercy to me. I'll praise Him till all men His goodness shall see. I'll sing of salvation at home and abroad till many shall hear the truth and trust in God. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. Song in my soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. Uh, Tyson called me there today, and out blue, uh, where'd he go? There he is. I wouldn't know if I could sing, so I study on before I tell him. I don't get back to him real quick sometimes, I know. But I like to study on, I tried to get the right songs for the service, make sure maybe I've got one the Lord wants to sing. And so I studied on a little bit, and these were the two songs that he gave me. And it's like he brought me out of that miry clay. And then he gave me glorious freedom. He gave us freedom. I'll try this one right here and see what happens. <clears throat> Once I was bound by sin's galling fetter Chained like a slave, I struggled in vain. But I received a glorious freedom when Jesus broke my fetters in twain. Emancipator, now and forever. 
from pride then all sinful follies freedom from love and glitter of gold freedom from evil temper and anger glorious freedom rapture untold torments freedom from care with all of its pain freedom in Christ my blessed redeemer he who has read my fetters in twain glorious freedom wonderful freedom no more in chains and I reply, Jesus the glorious emancipator, now and forever he shall be mine. Great singing. I think up next is a Beach Fort Quartet. Have you guys come up and sing for us? Sure, thank the Lord. <laughs> Will you pray for the old folks? We're uh, filling in tonight. We had uh, our uh, guys that were coming canceled on us, so we're. We're filling in singing and Kay was filling in preaching. So that's what you get tonight. But we are uh, just thankful for the Lord. Uh, got to visit with Mike and Mary today and had a really good visit with them. And uh, I'm telling you, he's holding on to the Lord and uh, said he's read his Bible through three times. <laughs> yeah. So he, he has to be doing something, you know, so I'm glad he's doing that. He's reading the Word up there right now. And, uh, you know, God is, is taking care of him. He's, he's kept him this far. And we're just going to keep praying, keep trusting God. But uh, uh, you pray for us tonight. This uh, this is a an old song that uh, I'm definitely no singer, but I'll try to squeak it out to you. So you help us, and we'll do our best. Go ahead, boys. <laughs> Lying helpless, suffering loss, but not hopeless. I am David, crying mercy, Lord, on me. I am Elijah in a cave, dreading the light of day. I am Daniel. Humbly bow faithfully. I am Paul in a prison, lifting praise to heaven. I am John, cast out but not I am Moses, seeking shelter. 
wonderful singing tonight. Amen. I'm, I'll go ahead and testify. My heart was beating on my chest. It felt like whenever you put me up here, it kind of forces me to do it, but I'm glad. Um, <laughs> right before Christmas break, we had a, a pretty busy week of work, and it was kind of when we were doing a like experimental project, designing new stuff, and they put me in charge of it. I'm not trying to brag or anything, but when... They put a, I was 20 at the time, when they put a 20-year-old in charge of something like that, it's pretty nerve-wracking, and I, I prayed and prayed about it, and everyone, everything went just as smooth as it could go, and we were, as we were doing the experiment and testing this part that we designed, the my coworker said, this is almost going too smooth, and I was like surprised, but yet not surprised, because I know what God can do. And I just kind of kind of handed to him that I knew why it was going smooth. But I just thank the Lord, and it's not over yet. Now we got to present it to our customers and stuff, and it's it's going to be a big step. I know God's leading me through, and I just thank Him and just continue praying for me there because I turned 21, and they're all like, "Oh, so when are we going to go out to drink and all that stuff?" I told them I don't drink. I, I really don't care to go out with you guys. But, but I try to maintain a friendly relate. It's hard. You got it's checks and balances to be with people like that. But they, it's my way of witnessing. I really feel like that's my main calling right there. Because just like my boss the other day he said, "Oh, you finally turned the big twenty-one. You can have that big beer." And I have no interest in that. But just continue to pray for me that I can continue to witness to him because God's really helping me there and everything. I just thank him for it. I got to testify for him. Kids, uh, our kids sing the song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Gonna Let It Shine. And uh, as simple as that song is, it's something to think about, isn't it? It's something to think about. Amen. Thankful for the services that we've already had today and the singing and the wonderful message that we heard this morning. And uh, God's in this place, and I thank Him for that. I do. I thank Him for, for being here. And he's the one that makes all the difference. I uh, Last week, it was last Sunday night, um, was the last Sunday of the year. And uh, here we are, the first Sunday of the year. And uh, I didn't know I was supposed to preach tonight until the other night when Tommy asked me. And uh, with my whole heart, I wish I could have said I was busy just so Dad would have had to. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but we're here tonight, and I'm... Uh, I've had this on my heart, and it's, it's funny how God does things, because I've had this, I had this on my heart when Tom asked me, and I just assumed I was supposed to preach it somewhere else, but here we are here tonight, and, and uh, God doesn't make mistakes and knows what we stand in need of, and uh, I'm thankful for God being God tonight, and if, if you would bear with me tonight, my throat has been scratchy all day long. I couldn't hardly teach this morning in class. It just seemed like I had something in my throat, so... Uh, uh, just uh, pray for me tonight, if you would, that I can get this out. But if you have your Bibles tonight and you want to turn with us, we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter number 24. It's uh, the last chapter of, of 2 Samuel, David's life coming to an end, about ready to hand it over to his son. And uh, to be honest with you tonight, if we had the time, I would really love to really read the whole chapter of 2 Samuel 24. There's so much in there that... Uh, that, that God has, has, I feel, laid upon our heart for it being the first Sunday of the year. And uh, I know we've all probably told our wives and our husbands what our New Year's resolution was. We're going to lose some weight, right? And that our New Year's resolution every year. We're going to lose some weight, and we're going to eat better, and we're going to be healthier, and we're going to do all these things. And uh, blowny, blowny, blowny. You know, <laughs> it is. By February, we'll forget everything we said. You get more times than not when it comes to, to that. But uh, I, uh, I tonight feel like that not only at the beginning of the year for a New Year's resolution, uh, uh, when it comes to, to being a Christian and serving God, we should always be striving to do better. Yeah. Uh, we really should. We should be striving at that every day. Uh, to, to never be, you've heard me say this so much, to never be satisfied where we are when it comes to God. And that's the great thing about God. You know, I feel like an athlete can only get so good at something. 
a basketball player can just get so good at shooting that ball. I mean, he can practice at five o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock in the morning, five hours before anything gets started. And, and you can only get so good at it. But the thing about God and being a Christian is you can never get too good at it. Uh, well, we can. There, there's, there's no such thing. There's, there's always areas in our life where we could do better. And, uh, and tonight I hope that uh, with, with what God laid upon my heart, you'll see what I'm talking about. Second Samuel chapter number 24, and we're going to start in verse number 18. Second Samuel 24 and verse number 18, and it says, And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord, and the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of God, went up as the Lord commanded, and Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Aruna said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Aruna said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for the burnt sacrifice, and threshing instruments, other instruments for the ox of the wood. All these things did Aruna as the king gave unto the king. And Aruna said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. And the king said unto Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God, for that which doth cost me nothing. So David brought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. And David built... There an altar unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land, and the plague was stayed from Israel. Amen. I'll stop right there. And tonight in 2 Samuel chapter number 24, David does something that is displeasing to God. Uh, the Bible says that David hit his knees at one point and cried out to God, I have sinned against thee. David realized that what he done was wrong. And he messed up. What did David do? David done something within his own power. He done something, he done, he done something without praying about it. He done something without asking permission from God if he could do it. He's just done something because he wanted to do it. And what was it that he did, Caleb? Well, he went and had his servants go out across Israel and across Judah. And David wanted a head count of how many standing men that he had that was going to be able to fight. And the Bible says that after nine months and 20 days went by, and like I said, if you, if you want to read all this later, you can, 2 Samuel 24. I'm just trying to save time here tonight. But David has his servants go out, and nine months, 20 days later, they come back and they say that there's 800 able-bodied men in Judah, and there's 500,000 able-bodied men in Israel. And that's what David wanted. He wanted the able-bodied men. He wanted to know how many men he had that could stand on their own two feet and fight and throw a sword. That's what David wanted. And if you're like me tonight, if, if you're the same as me, you're probably asking yourself the same question I asked, what's so bad about that? You know, that's how I felt about it when I was reading it. That's my question. Well, what's so bad about David wanting a head count on how many men that he had? Because in me tonight, looking at this and reading this, I think, well, that seems pretty responsible. Does it not? I mean, that seems pretty responsible. That seems pretty reasonable to want to know how many men do I have with me? How many men do I have standing with me? I think that's something we'd all really want to know in our hearts tonight is how many, how many do we have standing with us? How many do we have standing against us? And that's what David wanted to know. And I asked, what's so bad about that? Well, there's four things that I found that God was displeased with David about. I mean, it was so bad from David's standpoint of view, he hit his knees, he felt so bad about it, said, I've sinned against God for doing what I did because God didn't want it to begin with. What was so bad about it? The first thing that was so bad about that was displeasing to God was is that it caused confusion. It caused confusion. So what caused confusion? Whenever people are counted by the government, there's some anxiety on why they're being counted. 
I mean, is there not? If the government wanted to count how many of us was out there, it would probably cause a lot of confusion on why they was wanting a count of how many able-bodied men was out there. And I'm sure there was anxiety. I would say if there was social media, there would have been a lot of Facebook posts made on why in the world the government is doing what they're doing. If there would have been phones, I'm sure there would have been a lot of phone calls made. Why is the government counting us? Are we going to war? Are we going to battle? What's going on? Why is David doing this? We don't understand. There would have been a lot of text messages sent. I mean, there would have been a lot of gossip going on in Israel and Judah if social media and cell phones would have been a thing, wouldn't there? Uh, there would have been. Uh, there was a lot of anxiety going on on why David was doing what he was doing. Second thing was, is it discounted the disabled. David said, I want you to go out and I want you to count the able body man. So why is that displeasing to God? Is because he left the older ones out. And I'm going to say this and move on because I know we all agree on this tonight. How many would agree we need our older ones tonight? Amen. We need, we need them. They're just as important as anybody else. We need their faithfulness. We need their burden. We need their desire. We need their prayers. Everybody say amen on that one. Well, we, we need our older ones tonight. And when David goes out and says, don't worry about the ones that's 85, 95 years old. Just count the ones that can stand on their own two feet and fight. David left out the older ones, and that's a big no-no because we need them. We all need each other, don't we? We all need each other. Third thing was, the third thing was is now David was doing something that his enemies do. David was doing something that, you know where this all started? It all started with the Canaanites and the Amorites and all the knights that you want to throw out there. David was operating like his enemy would operate. Can I say tonight, when we start operating like our enemy operates, that's a big no-no tonight. When we start doing the same schemes and tactics that the devil wants to, that, that's a big no-no. David was acting like his enemy and God said, no, 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 don't act like them. You do what you've done up to this point and don't worry about what the enemy's done. You do what I tell you to do. So it was displeasing to God for that reason. Fourth reason why, and I feel like this is the biggest reason why, is David shows by doing what he did, he, was, uh, uh, he had a desire to rely on his resources. That's the big reason, and that's the one that really spoke to me the most in David doing what he did. God's saying, David, why in the world do you need to count how many men is with you? Don't you realize you're sitting on the throne tonight, not because of a man, but you're sitting on the throne tonight because of who I am and where I placed you. And you don't need a man to get you to where you need to go. I've already got you to where you need to go. You need to understand if you have 1.3 million men or you have three men, I'm God all by myself and I do, you don't need nobody else. And can I say, and I, as simple as this may seem, I'm thankful for you and I hope you're thankful for me. But as far as I'm concerned tonight, as long as we have God standing with us, as long as God is on my side, as long as God is in my heart, I really don't care tonight who's with me or who's against me as long as God's with me tonight that's really all that matters that's really all that matters and that's what God was most displeased with most of all is that David was relying on what he had instead of focusing on who he was and tonight when we start focusing on who's with us or who's against us, we'll fall out in a hurry. As long as we know tonight in our hearts that God is standing with us, that's really all that matters tonight. Amen. We rely too much on resources and, and who's standing with us or who's standing against us. I've got to the place in my life, if you love me, I'm tickled to death you love me. I've got to the place in my life where if you don't care for me, I'm going to heaven anyway, so it don't make no difference to me. God is with me and God is standing with me and if God is for me, who can be against me tonight? Amen, that's what David was operating on. He was worrying about how many he had when really it didn't matter how many he had. I feel like if God wanted David to have victory, if he had just had 10 men standing with him, with him, if God wanted victory, David would have had victory. Why? Because God was with David. And somewhere along the line, David sitting on his throne, he forgot that. He forgot that because he went out and counted all the men. How many do I have with me? But in reality, all David needed to do is realize God's with me. That's enough. If I have 1.3 million or I have 13, God's with me. And that's enough. Amen. Bible says after all this goes down, the people are counted. The servants come back nine months, 20 days later and tell him you have roughly 1.3 million men, able-bodied men, standing with you. Bible says that God was angry with David. God was upset with David. David fell on his knees and said, I've sinned against God, I've messed up in a big way. And the Lord shows up. 
The Lord shows up. It always makes a difference when the Lord shows up. And the Lord shows up. And God says, David, you get to pick your punishment. You get to pick what's going to happen. And here's the three things that David was to choose from. Three years of famine. Three, men, three months of his enemies ruling against him. Or three days of a plague. And I love what David says. I love what David says. He didn't pick one, two, or three, A, B, or C. David looks at God and says, God, I surrender to whatever you want. As long as I'm in your hand, it don't make no difference to me what happens. If you're displeased with me, I would rather live my life in your hands, displeased with me, than to live out in the world. Can I say that? I'm sure there's been times in my life I've displeased God. I'm sure there's been times in your life where you've displeased God. But can I say now, I would rather live my life in the hand of God with him displeased with me than me living out in the world tonight. And I'm thankful that we are in the hands of God. He said, I surrender God to whatever you want to happen. Whatever you want to happen, that's what David wants to happen. Well, our lives would be a lot simpler if we'd surrender to that right there. God, whatever you want to happen, that's what I want to happen. Life would be a whole lot simpler if we'd all get to that point in life. David is given the choice on what he wants. And the Bible says that God sent a plague over Israel that claimed the lives of 70,000 people. And the Bible says that God looked down at the angel and said, that's enough. And the plague stopped at the house of a person by the name of Aruna. And God looks at the angel and tells the angel to go tell David to go to Aruna's house. This is where we're at tonight in our text. I want you to go to Aruna's house. And when you get there, I want you to buy the property off Aruna. I want you to build an altar there. I want you to sacrifice and I want you to worship. So what's David do? He gets everything in order and he goes to Aruna's house. What we need to know about Aruna, he's just an average Joe. That's all he is. He ain't a servant. He ain't a warrior. He ain't, he's just an average Joe sitting at his house watching television. I mean, no, just being average. Being average. Sitting there not doing nothing. And, and the Bible says that David goes to his house and Aruna recognizes him right off the bat and knows who he is. We need to understand tonight that David just wants some guy. He's the king of Israel. He's the king. Of, he just doesn't go and check and see how Aruna's doing. You know, I mean, President Biden's not going to drive up beach for it and knock on my door and say, hey, Cap, how's things going? How's that going to happen? If he did, I'd say, get out of here. No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't. <laughs> I, I will, I, and King David goes to his house, knocks on the door, and says, I've been sent here by God, and I've got to buy this property off of you, and I've got to build an altar here, and I've got to sacrifice and worship God. And Aruna looks at him, and says, man, you're the king of Israel. You don't have to buy anything. You know what Aruna tries to give David? Tries to give him a hookup. He does. He tries to give him a hookup. I know who you are. You're King David. You ain't got to buy anything. You can have anything you want. You need a bull? I got oxen out in the field. You need tools? I got some back out in the shed. Whatever you need here, you can have. You ain't got to buy anything. And I love, this is my heart tonight. This is where I got this whole message from tonight. Is what David said back to Aruna when he offered to give him everything for free. Here's what David said. And the king said to Aruna, no. But I will surely buy it off of thee for a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. Listen now. My God, that which costs me nothing. In other words, here's what David is saying to Aruna. He's saying, Aruna, God's been too good to me. God has blessed me too much for you just to give me something and offer a burnt offering and worship God on something that costs me nothing. Can I say, God's better than that, Aruna. I gotta give you something in return for you giving me this because God's been too good to me. He's brought me too far. I'm sitting on a throne not because of who my dad is or my mom is or my cousin is, but because of who he is. And I gotta give you something for it tonight because I can't give you something that costs me nothing. And tonight, here's what David is saying. David's trying to get his life back in order from messing up. So here's what David is saying to Aruna. Aruna, I gotta do better. 
I appreciate your offer. I appreciate you wanting to give me something for nothing, but I got to do better. I messed up and I got to get my life in order. So he gives him five shekels of silver and he builds an altar and he worships God and gives him sacrifices. Tonight, David's saying this, I got to do better. Tonight, I know that was a long introduction, but here's what I want to preach on for a few minutes. We've got to do better. We've got to do better. Say, Kev, what are you talking about we got to do better? I'm here three times a week. I read 10 chapters a day. I'm in my prayer closet one hour every morning. What do you mean I got to do better? I about flat guarantee you tonight that if you examine your life, you will find an area somewhere with God that you could do better. You would find something somewhere where you could do better. I guarantee you that in 2023, you had a David moment where you said, you know what, I'm just going to try this on my own. I'm going to try to fix this on my own. Do you know what David did in 2 Samuel 24? He stopped trusting God. He did. He started relying upon him and started relying upon his resources and what he had and what he didn't have and started relying upon himself. Listen to me tonight. We can't rely upon ourselves. We can't rely upon each other. We can't rely upon Tom and Doug and the deacons and the board. We can't rely upon each other. We got to rely upon God tonight that he carried us to 2023. And if God carried us to, through 2020 and 21 and 22 and 23, then what makes me think tonight that God's not going to carry us through 2024. But as I look at my life and examine my life tonight, I see a lot of areas where Caleb could do a whole lot better. I could do a whole lot better. A lot of you look at me like, okay, but I'm saved. I'm here three times. I do all this stuff. I'm good. And that's what's wrong with us. That's what's wrong with us. We think we're okay where we are. I'm satisfied where I am, Cam. Man, I'm, I was here Wednesday. Man, Doug done good. Singing was good. I was here this morning. Tom preached his heart out. Singing was good. I'm here tonight. Man, I'm doing good. That's what's wrong with us. Everybody thinks we're doing good. We ain't doing good. We could do better than what we're doing. You want, you want 20, I don't you know what I want. I want 2024 to be our year. That's what I want. I want the church house full. I want people running and shouting. I want people being saved. I want people running to the altar and getting help and realizing that uh, I can't do anything on my own, but I can do everything with him tonight. Amen. Amen. The problem with us is we all think we're okay. We're good. I don't need no help. I, I'm, I'm okay right where I am. We're in trouble when we get to that shape. We need to do better. We need to do better. We be honest with ourselves. In 2023, we've had David moments. We, we look at our life, we've had David moments where we didn't trust God like we should. We didn't do what we was supposed to do. And David looks in the room and says, I will not give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. I got to give something. I got to do something. I got to do better than what I've been doing. And tonight... If we would all be real honest with ourselves, I mean, just be real honest with ourselves, and, and look at our life, we could find something somewhere to say, I could do better at that. You know, you know what's sad? Here's what's sad. Tom preached this morning, great message, and he preached on the importance of church. Did he not? Dad preached on it Wednesday night. Tom talked about it tonight. Why not talk about it one more time? It's important. It's important to me. I hope it's important to you. I really do. Dad talked about it Wednesday. Tom talked about it this morning about how being in church is so important. He done a great job. Talked about what it used to be like. Man, I get sick of hearing about what it used to be like. I do. I get tired of it. What's wrong with having it right now? I'll tell you what's wrong with having it right now. Everybody's changed. God ain't changed. But everybody else has. Everybody else has. Ain't as important as it used to be. Everything else is more important. I seen somebody put something on Facebook the other day that said, instead of using the excuse of, basically about, about coming to church, our excuse should be, I'm going to church instead of over everything else. But instead, it's the other way around. Our excuse is, oh, I can't go to church because I got this. It should be the other way around. I can't do that because I got to go to church. It's what it should be. And here's, what, here's what's sad. Here's what's sad. Tom talked about it this morning and done a great job doing it. The message was clear, crystal clear. It was black and white. It was point blank. It was gun barrel straight. Wasn't hard for me to understand. Where's everybody at that was here this morning? I mean, I know sickness is going around, but I would hate to say it, 75 people got sick this morning. And they ain't here tonight. It's just the truth. Nobody cares. 
We could preach until we're purple in the face. You know what's going to happen? You're going to get up tonight and you're going to walk out them doors and you're going to do what you want to do. I'm just telling you the truth. Now, I know this is point blank tonight, but it's the truth. We are going to do what we want to do regardless of how good God's been or how good he hasn't been. We're going to do whatever we want to do. It's the truth. I know it's quiet, but I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. Why ain't things like they used to be? Because everybody's changed. Everybody's changed. God ain't changed, but everybody else has. And I, I get so tired of hearing about what used to happen and what it used to be like and how wonderful it was and how great it was and all these things. Now churches are just skimming by week by week, hoping there's enough money coming in to keep the lights on one more week. I'm telling you, it's the God's honest truth. You think I'm lying. We have it good here, but we, we ain't got to worry about if we're going to have church next week. I know we'll have church next week. We got enough money to pay the electric bill. Lights will be on. The fans will be blowing. The electric will be on. We'll be here and we'll be praising God. I thank God for it. Some churches don't have that. Thought. They're worried about what's going to happen next month, let alone next year. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> Whether we want to chew it or spit it out, whatever you want to do with it, it's the truth tonight. It's the truth. We need to do better. We need to do better. In 2024, instead of worrying about losing 20 pounds, Let's worry about gaining 20 pounds on the Word of God. How about that? Right. Word of God. Let's, let's eat this stuff. Let's chew it. Let's apply it to our life. Let's get better. Let's get better. I said this to my class this morning. When we get better, when we strive to be a better Christian, you know what happens? We get better at everything else. When I strive, for example, if I would strive tonight and I would tell God, God, I want to be a better Christian. I want to read more than I've ever read. I want to pray more than I've ever prayed. I want to serve you harder than I've ever served you. I want to preach more than I've ever preached. If I said that to God tonight, you know what happened? I'd be a better husband. I'd be a better father. I'd be a better person. I'd just be better at everything else all because I strived at that one thing to do better at. Everything else falls behind this. Everything else falls back. Everybody's trying to do the opposite. Everybody's trying to be a better father and hoping to be a better Christian. When you strive to be a better Christian, everything else just falls right in line to make you better, to make you better. And that's my New Year's resolution. I want to do better. And as simple as that may sound, David done it. I want, he was trying to do better. I can't give to the Lord, which costs me nothing. I got to do better. And I've got to do better and you've got to do better. And by us trying to do better at this, everything else will be better at it. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? I was more excited about that than you are. But it's truth. Truth. You know, yesterday, I, I had the girls last night, just, just me and the girls. And uh, Macy doesn't think I'm cool anymore, but Tinley does, so I'm, I'm still riding that ride as long as I can. And you know what I did yesterday? Not maybe for uh, uh, straight, but throughout the day. You know what I did yesterday? I played Barbies for probably about two hours. You know what's miserable? Playing Barbies. <laughs> it's miserable. I'm not very good at it. She bosses me around and tells me what I need to do and how I need to hold the cup and all these things I don't do right, you know. But I played. Did I have a very good time? No, I didn't. But boy, she did. She had a good time. I want to do better. And not just this, but I want to be a better dad. I want to be a better dad. A couple, couple weeks ago, it was on a Friday evening. I got home from work. The girls got way more toys than what they needed for Christmas, just like your kids did. And for whatever reason, they pulled this little princess tent out of the closet that was about five or six years old, maybe even older than that. And it was in a bag about that tall and about that wide. And they dumped that on the floor and about 6,200 pieces went everywhere. And they said, Daddy, will you put that together? <laughs> there wasn't one ounce of me that wanted to put that princess tent together. And I was thinking of every excuse in the world on why not to put it together. Oh, girls, let's have a movie night. Let's play with this. Let's play with that. And Tinley melts my heart. I mean, she looks up at me with them eyes. Man, gets me every time. And she said, Daddy, will you please put my princess tent together? So here I am on the floor finding pieces. Instruction's been gone for five or six years. I'm guessing on what I'm doing, putting these pieces together. And about an hour and a half later, we got that tent up for them to play with it 10 minutes. 
They was done. They was playing in it. Half the pieces were broke. Where's that princess tent tonight? That princess tent is in the rumpke. That's where that princess tent is. That's God's truth. It really is. And they were playing with that and Tenley was going in and Tenley was coming out and they was just, for about 10 minutes, I was king of the mountain, you know. Daddy put that, they was chanting my name, Daddy, Daddy. I mean, I was sweating. <laughs> Get that tent together. And a little time, you know, time went by, time went by and we're sitting down there and Tenley wanted her main thing. She always wanted, she wanted snacks. And she's got to pick the snack that she wants. You've got to hold her up. And it's about a 15-minute process, her finding the snack that she wants. And she sat down in that tent. And she, I, for five minutes, I couldn't understand what she was trying to say. But I finally got what she was trying to say. She said, Daddy, you know why you put that tent together? And I said, why did I put that tent together? She said, because you love me. And that's the, that's the absolute only reason why I put that tent together. <laughs> because I loved her. Couldn't say no. Couldn't say no. You know, I, I look at one of the things I need to do better at. Here's what I need to do better at. I need to do better at spending time with the blessings God has given me. The things that God has placed in my life. Tom was talking about this morning, strengthen the things that remain. Can I say tonight, I am thankful tonight for the things that are in my life that remain. That could be gone. But God has blessed me so much and God has been so good, they're still there. And as long as they're still there, I want to spend time with those things. You know what they are? They're treasure that God has given us that we need to do better at spending the time with our families and our loved ones and the ones that we care about because we're only here for a short time and then we're gone. Then we're gone. Spending time with those that we love and that we cherish and the things that God has given us, I need to do better at that. Another thing God has showed me that we need to do better at. We need to do better. We need to do better at spending time with God. Spending time with God. I understand tonight, I understand with my whole heart that we are a busy bunch of people. We really are. I know we gotta be here and we gotta be there and we gotta be everywhere. I understand. Uh, I'm convinced tonight, I'm convinced that if, if God somehow come down tonight and said, Beach Fork, you're a bunch of busy people, I'm gonna give you an eighth day of the week. By the time we left here tonight, that eighth day of the week would be filled with something to do. <laughs> because we're just busy, we got stuff going on. But I'm gonna say this tonight, and, and this is one right here that struck me right between the eyes. If we're too busy to spend a little bit of time with God, then we're busier than God wants us to be. We need to examine our life, we need to look throughout our day and say, where can I spend time with the Lord today because it's an important thing that we got to have tonight. We got to take the time to spend with God. We have to. We got to have a prayer closet. We got to fight the devil. We got to fight the enemy's tooth and nail, it seems like every single day. How in the world are we supposed to do that if we ain't got no prayer life and we take the time to spend with God? It's the truth tonight. It's the truth. We're busy. We're busy. And you know, I, I look at that and I think about Sunday. I think, what's the Bible say? The Bible says that God created all this in what, six days? And on the seventh day, what did he do? Rest. Rested. When Sunday becomes like every other day, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. When Sunday becomes just like another normal day, me and my wife talked about this. She said, could you imagine having a weekend and just Sunday being like a Saturday? And I said, no, I really couldn't. I, all my life, Sunday has been a day where we're gonna set aside we're going to get up and we're going to get ready and we're going to go to the house of God. It's a Sabbath day. And God said on that day, he set it aside for the family to go to the house of God. And when it becomes like every other day, man, we're in trouble. We are in a world of trouble. This is the day God gave us. I mean, out of all the days of the week, God gave us one day to come to the house of God. And if we can't do that, man, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. You know, I could, I could spend a long time on this subject right here, but I, but I ain't going to. God gave us this day. Let's use it for the glory of God. Coming to the house of God. Bringing our families to the house of God. I'm thankful for Wednesday night prayer meeting. I love when I'm, I'm thankful for it. I, we, we need that service in the week. I, I'm thankful for it. But the Sunday is the day that God gave us. 
The day that, and Tom, Tom mentioned this morning, we gotta work, we got things, we got, I understand that. God understands that. He knows when we gotta work and we, we can't help that. We, we really can't. But let's just, be, let's just be down tonight where the rubber meets the road. More times than not, we just choose to do other things. We do. Choose to do other things. If, if you gotta get up on Sunday morning and discuss with your husband or discuss with your wife if you're gonna go shopping or go to the house of God, man, Need to be on the altar. I mean, it's just true. Need to be on the altar. This, this is where God wants us to be in the house of God. The one day of the week that God sets aside. If we're too busy to do that, we're, bu- we're too busy. We're too busy. Busier than God wants us to be tonight. And simply tonight, we need to do better at taking time to spend with God. And lastly, tonight, I want you to think about this one. I want you to think about this one. We need to do better and using the talent that God has gave us. We need to do better at that. God has blessed us. We have a talent somewhere. You do. One of us, all of us have a talent somewhere on the inside of you that we could use for God. God put that talent in you to use for Him. And I feel like tonight we need to do better. If you can sing, let her rip. That's truth. If you can sing, I mean, let it fly. If, if, if you're... If you're Testimony, I give a testimony. If, if, if your talent tonight is to, to be a door greeter, man, we got the best door greeters in the whole world. Uh, I mean, we got the best of everything. I, I mean, we really do. But when we look at ourselves, I, I guarantee you there's a singer out there we don't know about. I guarantee it. Uh, that's the truth. And if you ask Tyson if you could sing, he'd probably jump up and down. I mean, he, he would love it if you, if you started singing. He would. He'd, he'd be just excited, ecstatic about it. Let's look at what God has given us. Let's look at what God has given us. I wish I could sing. I hate myself every day that I can't. Because if I would, I would sing. I mean, I would. I'd let her fly every service. You wouldn't be able to. You'd ask my wife and kids. I sing all the time. I do. They get mad at me because it doesn't sound good, but I sing all the time. Sing all the time. But I guarantee you that you have a talent somewhere on the inside of you that you could use for the glory of God. And we need to do better at the talent God has given us at whatever it is. If it seems big, if it seems small, if it seems in between, don't make no difference. We need to do better at that. We need to do better in telling people about Jesus Christ. We do. We need to do better at telling people how good He is, how wonderful He is, how marvelous, how wonderful God really is. We need to show people that. Like what Tanner talked about before I got up here. You know what kind of testimony that is to look at a bunch of grown, grouchy men and say, I don't need to go drink when I turn 21? I don't need that in my life. I don't need alcohol in my life. Just by him not even saying anything about God and him letting his light shine and setting an example is speaking to those men somewhere, I guarantee it. I believe that with my whole heart. By just simply living a good Christian life goes beyond what we could ever imagine. It really does. Lastly, now I, could, I could preach for an hour on this because there's a whole bunch of subjects that we could do better at. But last but least, I know this may seem so, seem so small, and it really seems elementary. I mean, it seems like something you'd hear in elementary school. But we need to do better at being the best we can be for God. Being the best we can be. Do the best we can do. You know, sometimes, and I, I'm sure Tom will say amen when, when I say this, I would say sometimes on Sunday morning we make his job pretty hard. He's up here preaching, studied on Saturday. You know, it's not fun. It's not fun. It's not. I mean, the burden of it, the stress of it, it ain't a good time. I mean, it's not. Uh, I mean, yesterday, I wanted to go deer hunting real bad. But I knew I had to teach this morning and I knew I had to preach tonight and I wouldn't have had fun if I would have went deer hunting because I knew what I had to do today. It's not the best time in the world. And Tom studies and he prays and dad studies and prays and I study and pray for nine times out of 10 for you to sit back here and go, Yeah, I figured they'd get excited. We can, make it, we can make it easier on them. We could. We can make it easier on Tom. We can make it easier on Doug. I agreed with everything Tom preached on this morning. Agreed with all of it. I did. And you know, I, I think about it. If we all agreed, y'all just, I said I agreed, you all clapped saying you agreed, why wasn't we letting him know that we agreed? 
It would have made it a lot easier on him. It would have. If we all would have stand and said, Tom, I'm with you. Boy, who knows what would have happened. By something so small. What are you trying to say tonight, Kev? I'm trying to say we need to do better. Because when we do better, our services will be better. Our services will be better. Can I say tonight, I know I've, I've said this before and, I, and, and I'll be done. I'll be done, I promise. But one of my greatest fears that I think about pretty often is I got two girls that's eight and five years old. And I think about the future. I try to think about what it's going to be like in 10 years and 15 years and 20 years. I want a place for my girls to go to church in 15 and 20 years. I want a place where they can come. I want to say this. I want them to come to a place where they can go and feel the presence of God. Yes. Amen. Yes. I want that for them. So if I just don't have no burden to do better and you don't have no do, burden to do better, what's the point? What's the point? We got to have a burden. I need to be the best I can be. Why? For our young people. For our young people. That they can have a place to come to church in 15, 20 years. 25 years where they can still feel the presence of God it's the truth I talked to a man the other night that was here I ain't seen him for quite some time he said you know why I'm here tonight I said why is that I feared he'd say to come see everybody he said I need to get refueled I need to get, I need to get refueled he had to drive 55 minutes from his house to drive here to feel like he could get some refuel I said, Kev, what, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say there's not a whole lot of filling stations out there in the day we're living in. I seen a singer the other night that sings at this church. Me and my wife and some of her family went out to eat. Seen a singer. And, and she said, she was talking with us there and she's seen here before. And, and she said, my two favorite places I can go where I know I'll receive help is Rubyville and Beachford. That's the two places I know I can rely on that I can feel the presence of God. And that's not for us to boast or to, you know, to jump up and down and say, oh, how great are we? We're nothing tonight. It's the presence of God being here and us desiring for him to be here tonight is what it is, is what it is. Not that we're greater or better than, than, than anybody else. That's not what I'm standing up here saying. But we have a desire. I have a desire tonight that I want the presence of God in this place. And I'll do whatever it takes to keep it here. Do whatever it takes. Because he's the one that makes all the difference. And if we don't have a desire to do better, man, we're, we're in a bad shape tonight. We're in a bad shape. I want to be a better dad. I want to be a better husband. But most of all, I want to be better for him tonight. I want to be, look at your, I'm going to ask you to stand tonight. Go ahead and stand with me. Go ahead and stand with me. And I'm going to have Scotty come sing if he don't care. Just, just sing a verse. And I, I know I feel like I've preached forever tonight. I didn't mean to. But, but, but I want Scotty to come sing a verse of a song. And while he's singing, I want you just to examine your heart tonight. There ain't no reason to be afraid of these altars. My goodness sakes, we can use the altar. Ain't no, nothing to be embarrassed about. Examine your heart tonight. Look at yourself and say, what do I need to do better at? And if you feel like you need to come pray tonight, won't you come lay on the altar? Won't you come do that? I've already laid things out to God. I've, I, I feel like I had to preach this to myself and pray before I could come preach it to you because there's areas I need to do better at. I need to do better. And if you be honest with yourself tonight, you'd probably say the same thing. Go ahead, Scott. Sing us a verse for song tonight. Amen. Who wants to come? Amen. It's wonderful. Amen. Don't be afraid. Now. Just step out and come. Step out and come. Amen. Amen. Hear the blessed Savior calling the impressed.